Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 76. I'm speaking with Andrew Schmidt. He's one of the directors for Troll Hunters at DreamWorks Animation. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Hey, this is Alan. So just a quick thing to check out, www.vfxrates.com. This is a website that I created to solve a massive problem that we all have. What should we be charging? This is one of the giant mysteries that we all have and most people feel very uncomfortable talking about is what we should charge as a freelance rate. And the worst part is when we go to apply for a job, if we ask too much, we risk alienating the employer and never getting that call back. Whereas if we play it safe and ask too little, we not only get taken advantage of, but on top of that, we leave a lot of money on the table, which potentially over the span of a year can lead up to tens of thousands of dollars. So this is a chance for you to quickly go to the website, vfxrates.com, put in a few basic bits of information based on your city, your experience, your discipline, software, little factors that are very important to figuring out what you should be charging as your base rate when you're going to an employer. Now, this is based on a lot of research, but more importantly, it's based on a brain trust of industry experts from different fields that we've all pulled together and being able to maintain this as a very accurate way to generate what you should be charging. The best part is, is not only what you should be charging, but also potentially what you could be charging by tweaking a few things to how you present yourself, building your brand, learning to negotiate better. Also, other factors like building an irresistible reel learning to approach employers the correct way, learning to network, a lot of other factors. I want to share all this information for free. Go to www.vfxrates.com and find out what you should be charging for your hourly VFX rate. All right, welcome to a brand new episode. This is with Andrew Schmidt, who's a good buddy of mine I've known for three years. And I know that it's three years because we met at the It's Art Masterclass in Paris and uh, at the very first one, which was three years ago. And uh, Andrew's a really good friend of mine. He's a super great guy. Uh, I was really excited to do this just because Andrew's got such a vast amount of experience within the industry, Um, obviously doing a massive stint at Pixar for quite some years. And before that, um, getting to work on projects like one of my favorite movies, The Iron Giant, Prince of Egypt, and on and on. What I've really loved is each year that I've attended the It's Art Masterclass, Andrew's talks have always been one of my favorites just because they have so much more substance than a lot of the surface level stuff that we might typically expect. And usually they kind of take you on a bit of a journey through his career, his insights, but more importantly, a lot of the the life lessons he's learned on his journey to wherever he's wanted to go at that portion of his life. And I thought this would be really great to talk to him just because not only can he talk a lot about his humble beginnings and how he got started and his uh, journey of working internationally at quite a young age, but also more recently, um, a lot of the transitions he's experienced as well. So there's a lot that we go into. So in case I haven't mentioned it yet, he's currently one of the directors of Guillermo del Toro's Troll Hunters for DreamWorks Animation. And he's also worked on a lot of really amazing projects, all of the classics that we love, like The Incredibles, Finding Nemo, Monsters, Inc., Up, and on and on and on. And we also talk about Family Guy, which was kind of interesting. I guess season one of Family Guy um, he contributed to as well, which I thought was one of those um, kind of funny additions that we threw in there. But we talk about a lot of stuff. I was really excited to do this. Like I said, Andrew has so much substance, has a lot of experience and a lot to contribute. So I knew this would be a really killer episode. One thing that I will mention is that the audio quality on this episode isn't the greatest, and I apologize for that. However, what I recommend to you is to not focus on the level of quality of audio, but focus on the level of quality of content that we discuss. Okay, so this one episode might be a little bit more difficult than the typical audio quality that we usually have. I always take pride in having really great quality 
in all the episodes. This one, unfortunately, just didn't turn out quite the greatest. However, like I said, focus on the quality of the content that we discuss. Finally, I'm just going to mention that if you enjoy this talk, uh, I believe you can get Andrew's It's Art Masterclass talk in, by the time this is out, um, they'll be out as well. So I'll leave a link if you want to ever access that. I think it's like $10, something like that. It's not too much. So if you want to check that out and learn more about Andrew, you can do that there. And of course, in the show notes, you can check out all the information about him. So if you go to www.alamckay.com slash 76, so seven, six. All right, so let's dive in. Do you want to give a bit of a, a background into like how you kind of found your passion and discovered animation? Yeah, um, I let's see. I never intended to start an animation or have a career in animation. I'm not one of those people that watched cartoons or animation thinking that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I never studied it in school per se. Uh, I my interest from childhood on were monster movies and films, adventure films, and Journey to the Center of the Earth, Frankenstein, Dracula, things like that, Creature from the Black. And I wanted to get into monster making prosthetics and visual effects, and that led into. Oof, I started. Let's see, I went to a small college called Albion College in Albion, Michigan, which is a liberal arts college, and I didn't do well academically in the beginning, and then I fell into taking some art classes. And so I wasn't, wasn't until I was in my late teens, early 20s, when I actually started taking art classes at college. And from there, I tried to, they didn't really have, they had a um, more of a fine arts program there. So I was studying fine arts and I started to sort of engineer my own classes in, in film and animation and things like that, just to try and, you know, find out more about what I really wanted to do, which was, you know, get into special effects and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I engineered a few classes of, of some filmmaking. I did some matte painting, and this is all pre-digital. Yes. You know, I did matte painting and glass, and I touched on some animation, studied some animation, um, and that was really kind of the beginning. And then just as, as I, I tell everybody, it's, you know, about this business is a lot about making connections. I had a very dear friend who had gone abroad, and she was traveling in Scotland and England, and she came across a studio there that was starting up in 8990 called Amplimation, which was Steven Spielberg's studio. Mm -hmm. Build up uh, a 2D studio to do a film called Five Goes West, the second film for uh, this character, Five. Uh, and so I, I finished college, a four year college with a visual arts degree in kind of no direction, and ended up doing construction for a year when this friend, Jamie, uh, Jamie Folio called out of the blue and said, hey, I'm, I'm in London, I'm working at a studio here and they're looking for people. Uh, I know you wanted to get into animation and film. And I'm like, why don't you send your stuff in? So I sent in my life drawing portfolio and I got hired as an in-betweener. This was you know, 1990. And so I packed two suitcases and moved to London and started working in animation on Five of Goes West as an in-betweener. And I ended up staying in London. The studio stayed open five years, I think we, they folded in 95, mm -hmm. and we did Philo Goes West, We're Back at Dinosaur Tail, and Balto, Journey of Courage, three, three uh, 2D films. And that studio um, folded into DreamWorks. They took a large number of people from that studio and brought them to LA to form DreamWorks. And so that's how I ended up in Los Angeles working at DreamWorks back in 96. Man. Yeah, I was, I mean, I'd been doing a, like, this is more 3D, but I'd been doing a little bit of 3D. I think I just started doing my first big project around 96, um, such a long time ago. And like, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I love that because like, you definitely, you look at Amblination, sorry, Amblination. I can't, I, wow, I found Am a tongue tie, sorry, tongue It's a tongue tongue. tough one to say. Yeah. It is tongue Amblination. Is Amblination. Yeah. <laughs> I have to, the rest of today, I'm going to be walking around trying to say it over and over. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you you know, look at that, and then yeah, you're right. How it spawned uh, the DreamWorks. I mean, that essentially was uh, huge, like one of the big ones that a lot of anime came from. Especially, um, mm -hmm. no, like, uh, that's really amazing. Like, it's just kind of curious because it's been so many years since I've thought about this. But what's the the hierarchy like? Uh, I'm just kind of curious about that. Like, when it comes to in betweeners and keyframers, let's say. Um, in terms of, I guess, the industry, like, were back then, were um, if you're more of an in betweener, was that more kind of like, you know, how many, let's say, of them versus keyframers were there typically in a studio? Whoa. Because typically these days that all gets outsourced. Um, so yeah. you, know, you don't get to yeah, see it in the same shop. 
Yeah. Well, it was broken down by team and by character, mostly. Uh, so you would have a supervisor who would head up one, one certain character. Like on Balto, I was on the character Steel, who was the villain. And, uh, so you had a supervisor who was in charge of the character and, and did a lot of main animation and key scenes. And then under that animator, there were several... The supervising animator, there were several other animators, um, four or five, who handled the bulk of the work, and under them were assistants, and then under them in between, or so sort of a pyramid. Mm-hmm. And, um, I don't know, maybe per team, there were five or six in betweeners. Mm-hmm. And just uh, so initially starting out, like for you, uh, kind of just supplying your life drawing portfolio, like was it pretty easy to kind of get your foot in the door that way or was it more kind of luck or how do you feel in terms of, let's say um, for everyone else who is applying, um, what do you think were the key things that got you in? Obviously talent being one of them, but do you think um, mm-hmm. some of that also played into <clears throat> having connections or uh, your work think, standing out more than others? I think it's a little bit of everything, you know, if it, it's not going to be one thing more than the other. It was, you know, my life drawing portfolio was pretty strong, but I, wouldn't say it was brilliant, you know, some of the stuff I see now, I'm just blown away by it. Right. But it was also, this was at a time when I think there were, they were doing in London, there were Roger Rabbit, there was Roger Rabbit, a few other films, that they just didn't have enough people to do all the work. And so they were really looking to bring in people from all over to, you know, film studios and mm-hmm. something ridiculous like four or five feature films being done at the time. The animation business was booming and there were a lot of small studios that we'll see as well. So there was the luck of that, the need. There was being prepared of having a portfolio already, and there was some persistence where I, you know, called the producer, Steve Hickner, quite a few times and badgered him. Um, and then there was also having someone in the studio that knew me, was champion. Mm-hmm. So, hire this guy, he's good, you know, get things done. Yeah. And so it was, you know, a good group of things. That's cool. And you're right. I mean, I think that you got to play on all of those things. I mean, half the time, um, it does come down to that because. It can be such a competitive field, especially animation, and especially you're right then when things are really booming uh, in terms of uh, more main, getting some mainstream feature animation um, happening, whereas opposed to Disney and uh, a couple other uh, key players being the ones producing all the content. Um, that's cool. Yeah. You never did any short films early on in your career, did you, or or did you? No, I, I didn't. I mean, I did some grade school, some animation, things like that, but I... I, I have to admit, no, I never did an actual film. I've always felt that, that I admire people who have done that. And I just, I didn't. I don't know why. I've just been in the business and busy nonstop since I got in. So. That's a good problem to have. <laughs> um, what are your opinions, though? Like, I was curious about this. Um, do you think it's a good idea for those starting their career to uh, look at doing short films as a way to build their career? So not specifically for the sake of passion, but more because, you know, this is something that may establish them and help kind of jumpstart their career? You know, my personal opinion, I think so, yes. And I, you know, I don't know what Pixar's hiring practices are now. I'm not there, so I can't really speak for Pixar, but mm-hmm. I can talk about, you know, when I was there and I was part of the, the crew that was looking at portfolios and doing some hiring. And that was one thing that would, would impress me and some of the others was you would have people who were in professional work that was quite strong, or you know, even student work that was quite strong, but then they would have a film as well uh, that was very individualistic and, and just showed, you know, kind of their ideas on story, storytelling. There's just so much you get out of a short film that somebody does, and not to mention the, the fact that they put a lot of time and effort into doing something personal. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a certain level of dedication that is required to do that. That's pretty impressive. I think you're right from the hiring standpoint. Like, it shows that, you know, even if it's not going to, you know, be uh, comparable to production work, it still shows they're able to go through an entire production. They've had to, um, you know, wear many hats and mm-hmm. you can also yeah. see where the strengths are because they've had to test themselves in so many other areas and opposed to doing like an 11 second club or, um, mm-hmm. you know, matching dialogue to Tom Hanks or, or whatever, you know, the flavor of the month yeah. is. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely uh, gives complete transparency about like, you know, who, who they are and, and what they can do. Um, yeah, because you can, you can tell if, if they're a strong storyteller, if they're an entertainer, if they're, if they're acting jobs or like you can find a lot of things with the Metro film. Cool. And I'd say like, this is such an open-ended question, but like, um, <coughs> what do you think the industry is like these days compared to uh, back then? Like, you know, what are some of the kind of big differences you've found um, 
or, you know, in terms of especially the digital animation industry, how much has changed from, let's say, you know, 95 was Toy Story and that was like the big mm-hmm. establishment, establishment there for uh, more mainstream uh, computer animation. But uh, obviously it's boomed so much and changed so much over the years. Like, how do you think it compares now to then? Like, what are some of the big differences? I don't think I'd ever get hired. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the talent coming up is just incredible. It's crazy. Just, yeah, just at, at a student level, it's mind blowing. Good. Some people are. Um, <laughs> I like putting people on the that, spot. That is, I know that is a good question because uh, as I was you know, so junior back then. Well, I mean, I'll say this: like you're right. Like one of the big things I always think about is you know you'd go to Art Station or CG Talk a few years ago, and you just go on there and like the stuff that people are putting out there as a student reel is depressing for me because it's just like holy crap you know like back when i was starting out we'd have like povere and all these like really crappy uh difficult to use programs and suddenly now you <laughs> you can literally open a package and kind of get the, the feel for it pretty quickly and be able to see yeah. in the viewport like um you know a shaded view let's say uh you know back then would you would take that for granted because you you would literally have to render something if you wanted to see what the hell it looked like and yeah. um but yeah, just in general, there there definitely is, and especially animation, it's such a over in my opinion, an oversaturated industry because everyone mm-hmm. wants to do animation, and because of that, it means that you know when you are applying for work in the beginning, you're going to have to find mm-hmm. some ways to stand out because uh, otherwise, you're going to get lost in the noise of so many talented people, um, and yeah. you know early on, you might not have had that as much, but you also you know, it would be very difficult to also f- find like where there was work, whereas now there's obviously quite a lot of work too. So that's the advantage. Yeah, I, I would. I think you bring up a good point that the tools have changed drastically in the last. I mean, and they're changing drastically on a daily basis. What you can do and what people are capable of doing. But if you have almost a feature feature film on their own, feature film would work. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's just a demo. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah, and um, I don't know, I, I, I guess like kind of touching on that subject, you know, are there any like major misconceptions you find that people uh, commonly have in their head, like, um, you know, this software package is the best, and if you're not using this, then, you know, you're not going to do as well, or you have to go to school um, to, you know, get a job in the industry, or like whatever kind of BS that people typically, um, you know, think is the way or the path, and it's it's completely the opposite. Yeah, I mean, no matter what the tool is, you have to have the talent behind it, definitely. You know, it's like, you know, people, I see people, you know, photographer friends, and they're like, well, what camera do you use? Well, that's <laughs> not so much the camera, it's, you know, the person behind the camera that's getting the shot. Yeah. You know, they, use the, they, they use the tools to develop the shot as well, but, you know, there's sort of a raw talent behind it. There's um, a pretty famous uh, story of Stephen King is doing a Q&A after a presentation he gave and someone raised their hand and was asking, you know, like, what pen do you write with? <laughs> is this all one of these, like, okay, I'm shutting this conversation down. This is the stupidest question I've ever been asked. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. And you find that that's, I don't know, there is a certain naivety to that. Do you, um, kind of talk, talking on what you said before, but like, do you have any advice for people starting out, like when they first break into the industry? Um, Ways to kind of make themselves stand out from everyone else. Uh, I think I think there's something to be said for one thing I discovered that, that was a bit difficult for me was when I was at Pixar. I became a, very much a specialist in just you know animating, and that's what got me in there. I, I had a certain quality to my reel and my animation that they really liked. And that was my strength, and so I went into Pixar with that strength of being an animator and being able to you know do a certain type of acting or action shots and entertainment quality and things like that. And then when it came time to leave Pixar, I found that it really still, I had some other talents and strengths, but not as much as I needed. I was pretty much still strongly animation based as an animator. And suddenly I'm trying to get out of this world and I see everybody knows a lot more than I do. A lot of them in different programs. They know, yeah, just they had a wealth of knowledge and experience that I hadn't had because I had become you know, isolated. I think you just need to, you know, you need to have a talent and you need to be good at something, but you need to keep, you know, finding your weaknesses and trying to strengthen those things. Mm-hmm. Find, I didn't understand much about storytelling, so I took a writing course and that told me a lot about storytelling and writing and building a scene or act within a scene. Um, I found that I 
art background was more, you know, fine arts. And then I started getting into animation, which is links to illustration and things like that. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know anything about really illustration. So I started taking some illustration courses just to fill in those gaps. And I, I think that's something that you can do, especially with everything that's available today is, is you don't want to become necessarily a jack of all trade, trades master of none, but you need to, if you're going to build this, this career, this and that's essentially what you want to do. I think you're not looking for a job. You're looking for a career. You want to build a career. You know, Especially this industry. Yeah, it's going to take a lot of bricks to build that, <laughs> that wall. So you need to yeah, you know, keep finding another brick to put in. I think it's really valuable advice. And it's one that um, lately has been coming up a lot is exactly that. Like, I think that a lot of people, you know, in, in fact, I'm going to segue uh, to something. Uh, I heard this like Tony Robbins conversation the other day, um, which it wasn't all woo. It was essentially just to talk, essentially talking about um, uh, growth and I guess uh, reciprocity in terms of um, mm-hmm. self growth, like learning and then giving mm-hmm. back and uh, mm-hmm. more about the fact that uh, typically a lot of people, they, they learn a lot and they feel like they get to a good point and they kind of just switch off their radar and they're just like, okay, good. Like I've, I've got my bag of tricks and they feel fulfilled and that's where they kind of stay. And it just means that, um, you get to a certain level and then you essentially kind of just fall into that, that safety margin of like, all right, I'm good. Whereas a lot of other people, the ones who, in my opinion, really succeed, have that kind of ping pong effect of growing and then giving back or teaching um, mm-hmm. because that's a, a form of allowing them to kind of grow and, and process the information more, but then kind of ping ponging back to growing again. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I honestly think that the more that you you constantly are looking at the next level, the next level and never settling, that's where, you know, you stay hungry and you kind of keep growing. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, it's, sorry, go ahead. I was just thinking, you know, Michael Caine talks about that in his book. I can't remember the name of the book. But he talks about, you know, what we do as, you know, artists, and some people don't like to, you know, talk about animation as art or an artist, but we are in a sense like, you know, we're collecting things from our lives, you know, mm-hmm. what we do to express ourselves. But it, it's a community, you know, and community is about taking from other people, but then giving back as well. So there's a certain amount of sharing that needs to, to, we need to do to grow. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as, as you said, you know, looking at the surrounding areas, and that's something I've mentioned a lot. I kind of, I came with like a really tacky um, way to coin phrase it a long time ago, but uh, your trifecta. In other words, like looking at the the three areas that are kind of closest complement what you do. So mm-hmm. if there's something like, um, let's say animation, yeah, you would probably, depending on the type of animation, you might look into comedy writing. Uh, you would definitely look into acting. Uh, you might also look into um, other areas, you know, like, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but, you know, that's exactly it. You you find the surra- surrounding areas that are going to strengthen that one. And, you know, with effects, I always say it's like um, scripting, lighting, and compositing. And for modeling, you would probably want to learn more about anatomy. You would probably, depending if you're having to do a lot of um, stuff that's rigging friendly, maybe you want a little bit of character rigging just to understand, like, how your body's going to need to deform, like, put more topology in the shoulders and the back, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, on top of that, maybe life drawing just to understand weight Absolutely. and balance and structure and all the same motion and things like that too. You know? Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I mean, I even feel like even with your career, I always think that it's better to be at the bottom of the barrel of the people you're around because uh, again, it's one of those things, especially later in your career, it's very easy to say uh, you've got your buddies who are kind of like pump up your ego and tell you how great you are and mm-hmm. they're not the people that you want to be around because you know it might be mm-hmm. great for some people to, to have their their friends that make him feel warm and fuzzy. But for me, I would rather be around a bunch of people that I feel like I've got to grow myself. I need to um, be at their level. And yeah. that's always going to you know help them pull me up and also push me to kind of have that fire under my butt. And, you know, yeah. I, yeah, I think it's so critical. I mean, we just mentioned that earlier about me moving to Portland. I was saying how, in a way, I want to put myself out of my comfort zone and go somewhere where, in a way, it's going to encourage me to work hard to get back to where I want to be. Um, but it's all about growth in that re- regard. Yeah, and that, that's, I mean, that's what I was feeling with Pixar as well. I reached a certain level. I sort of reached a glass ceiling there as well, where I was going kind to of advance it further. And, but the, the job was great. The projects are great. The people are great. I, I loved everything about it, but I was feeling really stagnant. And, uh, uh, I just felt like I needed to get my ass kicked. Mm-hmm. And I needed to get out there. And it's, it's you know, it's a weird a bit of an odd segue, but I'm uh, boxing. Yeah, you mentioned that. 
Yeah, I, yeah. And I, I don't necessarily, I can't say I enjoy getting in the ring because I don't like getting hit. But, <laughs> you know, I, it's, it, that's, I'm pushing myself to do something I'm not comfortable with. Um, I must like it because I keep doing it. But, that, you know, it, it is, you know, you're not going to grow if you don't push against your comfort zone or break out of your comfort zone. And sometimes you just got to take a beating and <laughs> pick yourself up and figure out what you did wrong and what you did right and don't repeat the mistakes. And <laughs> You know, you just, yeah, you're not going to grow unless you, you get out there. Yeah. And it also helps too. I mean, a lot of people kind of trying to find their purpose a little bit, um, finding the things that you don't like, like getting hit might help you find what you do like. Um, but it, it's funny, I was watching this episode of, it wasn't No Reservation, but it was one of the Anthony Bourdain shows recently. Mm-hmm. And he ended up back in, I think it was in San Francisco. It was in Oakland. It was SF. And he was actually there because he was finishing up some jujitsu training that he'd, actually, no, it wasn't. It was BJJ that he was doing. Um, uh, the past like couple like past year and a half or something. So in a way, he kind of decided, which I love the freedom of having that kind of career. But he decided to do a few episodes in that area purely just because he was going to be um, back in SF. So, um, but for you, like I'm kind of curious about that. So you decided like one day that you wanted to kind of get into to boxing. Like you know, how did that kind of come to be? And uh, and, and I'll just interrupt for a second to say that uh, I think this is actually really important. It's not like oh okay cool like you like walking dogs as a, a side hobby. Like for for you to kind of have like that little inkling of like all right, I'm I'm really interested to do something completely different. And yeah. knowing you, like again, I I've, I haven't you know sorry, I'm getting tongue tied again. Too much caffeine. I haven't known you forever, <laughs> but like at least um you know, the interactions I've always had with you have, have always been great and I wouldn't ever have pictured you as someone in the boxing just because you're a very calm kind of person. Mm-hmm. And that's why yeah. like um when you did first mention, I was just like that in a way is um like a whole new um kind of life experience for you to explore and it kind of for me is very exciting just kind of hearing you kind of going down that kind of avenue yeah uh i guess i, I don't know i mean i've done martial arts quite a bit throughout my life off and on and i was a big fan of bruce lee early on i still am uh and a lot of it was just physicality i was sitting at a computer a lot all the time and uh this was part of the complacency I was facing as well in my life and career. I just felt like I was stagnant personally and career-wise and personally and I was gaining weight. And, so I, you know, my age, I hit 50 and I'm like, I don't want to go through 50 being out of shape. And I'm not quite sure what drew me to boxing. I guess I've always been interested and I just never had the balls to just go and do it. And uh, luckily I found a club that's not hard, hardcore. You know, they're not trying to kill me. They're trying to get me in shape and... And, you know, it's very controlled when you get in the ring, which is nice as well. I'm not a big fan of getting hit in the head because I don't think it's very healthy either. So <laughs> you don't want to take too many blows to the head. Um, but again, it was, part of it was, you know, I did feel a certain fear about it. It's like, I'm not going to back down from this. I want to face this. I want to get in there and face this and, and you know, see what I can learn about it. And how do I feel after I come out facing something I don't like to do or that I, that I kind of have an apprehension about doing? And... After a while, you know, the, the, the tension, the fear goes away and you enjoy yourself and you can push yourself in ways you, can, you, never, wanted to, you never thought you could do. So. Were there, um, I guess, any kind of unexpected you know, differences you've noticed, like whether it was like more clarity of thinking or whether you felt more um, uh, like pushed at work, more energy or, you know, just different things that you might have experienced like after doing that for consistently, let's say for 90 days or, or whatever it might be? Well, I mean, definitely got in shape, but there's also this, this mentality you get, uh, this energy you get sometimes of it's almost a high, you know, you just feel like you've accomplished something or, you, you know, you, I don't know, it's hard to, it's hard to put it, maybe it's an ego thing, but you know, I just, I feel like I have more energy and I feel like, you know, other things that bothered me or other fears I had, and, you know, there are many, I'm not necessarily a great person, you know, there are a lot of things, little things that I'm, you know, you just worry about like, oh, I don't want to do that because of this, and, uh, you know, you can convince yourself not to do things very easily. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that just drops away. You just do it. You know, you stop. It, it shuts down the doubting mind, which is a big thing I've, I've thought for a long time. It's this little voice in me you know, over my shoulder going, oh, you can't do that. You're not going to be good at that. Don't do that. Mm-hmm. No, what? it's easier if you just sit here and have coffee and stuff. <laughs> and, you know, it's easy to listen to that voice because then you can sit there and go, yeah, you know what? This feels pretty good. I'm just, you know, 
nothing bad's going to happen. But it's kind of like, you know, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. It's not that nothing bad's going to happen. It's just nothing's going to happen. So that's no way to live life. I think it's like a massive psychological wall that uh, everyone goes through, especially artists and especially people like, I guess, like entrepreneurs, anyone who's taking risks. And, um, you know, I think that the key thing is that psychologically you're you're trained and conditioned to stay with what's safe and what you know, mm-hmm. so what's comfortable. Yeah. And because of that, you anytime some great opportunity comes up, you might be like, oh, I really want to do this. This is what I've wanted to do my entire life. And then bit by bit, you start to convince yourself like, I better stick yeah. to what I've been doing because I didn't get killed or bitten by a snake or fall off a cliff or whatever, <laughs> you know, kind of stuff that we've ingrained in ourselves um, from generation to generation we stick to that's what, an australian thing being <laughs> <by a> snake, <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i guess that's uh that's it it's like yeah well i haven't been bitten by a spider snake shark or crocodile lately so um but it's kind of funny because everyone who i speak to who i consider to be like very successful and i'm about to add you to this i hope um uh is that um yeah they've always agreed to the same thing that you know, whenever I say like, hey, was there ever like a massive like risk, something that you needed to do and you were really kind of afraid of uh, of doing it. But, you know, taking that saying that yes, when every bit of you kind of wanted to kind of stay complacent, that's like when all the, the massive changes started happening in your life and your career. Because um, mm-hmm. I, I think that a lot of us, whenever I kind of ask people of that, like whether there was that one thing. Um, everyone always seems to get like a big smile on their face just because it's like, yeah, they can completely relate to it. And I've seen the opposite though, where I've known people who have like had this one thing that they wanted to do their whole life and then they get faced with it and it's their opportunity to actually go out and, and say yes and do it. And they start to convince themselves otherwise. And not only do they end up saying no to that thing, but then after that, they kind of convince themselves permanently of like, no, I'm actually really happy where I am and I don't need to go any further and you know, completely re, re, you know, re-engineer like their whole uh, mindset. So for you, like, were there any kind of massive breaks that, or big breaks that you wanted to strive, you know, to struggle a little bit, but uh, grow into a whole new uh, place of where you're at? What do you mean? Was there something that I didn't do? Well, no, like uh, right. other way around. I mean, uh, I'm uh, pretty sure I can think of one right now, but, um, you know, just in terms of like where you were, you were mentally at and where you wanted more fulfillment, more pushing the boundaries mm-hmm. of what you're doing. And well, even Pixar was definitely exactly yeah a, a hard one. Yeah, that was. I mean, you know, like I said, it was. It is heaven up there. It is a great place. It is a great place to learn. It is a great place to explore, and it, it's very safe. You know, it's, you know, and I learned so much there, and I have friends there, and I miss it terribly. But then I was, you know, getting hungry and feeling. I think complacency is death to an artist. Mm-hmm. You you need to maybe the it's just, you know, not because I had, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with artists, but maybe just a personality thing for me. I, you know, I, I was missing feeling challenged. And, you know, I, I felt I had developed a certain level of skills that I really wanted to put to work, and I didn't know if I could. And, um, you know, I left behind, I, I was lucky in that, that you know, I, I didn't have kids, and I didn't own a home, so I wasn't restricted by financial means. And I wasn't going to put anybody else at risk. Mm-hmm. And so I was also looking at that thinking, this is really stupid. I don't take a chance and get out there. And, um, I was, I got some really good advice I, I, from somebody, uh, and I cannot remember who it is, uh, but he told me, because I, I was feeling the need to leave Pixar for a while. And he said, you're feeling the push, right? And I was like, yeah, and I feel this like, like push, like I need to get out. And he said, well, you need to wait until you find a pull, something on the outside that will pull you out instead of, you know, something that pushes you out. And uh, this is, again, where luck stepped in. Um, Rodrigo Bloss, who had been working at Pixar for quite a while and worked together in several projects, he did a short film called Alma, about a kind of spooky little short film about a doll, a little girl in a doll shop. Um, he, because of that short film, and this is where doing your own personal work can come in handy, he, because of that short film, he got noticed by Guillermo del Toro, and was contacted by del Toro, and del Toro said, why don't you come and uh, work with me at DreamWorks when we're trying to do a film together? And so Rodrigo jumped at that opportunity that was beginning with Troll Hunters, as well as developing Alma as a feature. Mm-hmm. So he left Pixar and went down to DreamWorks to work with del Toro, and they developed Troll Hunters as a feature for quite a while. It just didn't work out, and they developed it as a TV series. 
And Rodrigo had known I was looking to get out, and he called me and said, Are you still thinking about leaving? I said, Yes. And so he had me come down and interview a few times. Uh, that was the pull, this chance to work on something a little bit different, uh, a little more edgy than what Pixar does, um, and to work loosely under Del Toro and with my friend Rodrigo. And, you know, it sounded like a very interesting project. And, you know, a chance to direct a TV series. So, uh, they were putting faith in me, and I had to go through the, through the interview process. But again, this is where I, you know, I hadn't really done much directing. I've done a few commercials and things like that at Pixar, but this was going to be a bigger step, and there was a chance I was going to get ass kicked. There was a chance I was going to fail. So, but I, I couldn't pass it up. You know? So I left behind a very steady job, a very high income. I mean, I, had, I left behind a lot of money up there, you know, because I had bonuses and long term incentives and things like that, mm-hmm. and I took a pretty hefty pay cut to come down to Los Angeles to work on Troll Hunters because TV just doesn't pay what feature does. But I have found the work much more fulfilling, much more challenging. I was just ready for it. It Nothing against Pixar. I'd done what I could do up there. It was was time to go for me. So what was going through your mind at the time? I'd imagine it would be a pretty emotional time, not just... um, yeah. Nerve wracking, but something, something kind of like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that was kind of yeah, yeah. going through the loss. So. There's no undo button for um, decisions like that. No. <laughs> was there any moment where you kind of decided, like, okay, this is the right move and, you know, it's it's not the end of the world? Because obviously it's not, you know, but you still don't want to rock the uh, boat with something that you've kind of grown to love. I never, you know, I, I, that was part of the thing that I think that made me realize it was the right choice because I never really had any doubt. I had, you know, some apprehension, some worry about, um, you know, there was some nervousness about it, but I just, it just felt right. It seemed the right choice. And, you know, it was, it was, it was going into another great project. Yeah. So. Um, and let's, we'll talk about DreamWorks in a moment. I kind of figure, um, you know, there's so much stuff I, c- I could go on for forever, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, but I figure, you know, I'd love to talk about some of the previous projects we've done prior to kind of mm-hmm. getting to uh, that stage in your career like um mm-hmm. going back to before pixar you worked on the iron giant um what were you doing on that because again that's such a a classic and important film to so many um animators or you know throughout time like mm-hmm. that was i was an animator on the iron giant and that was again a you know being prepared but also having a fortuitous event you know unfold before me and that I was I finished Prince of Egypt and uh, DreamWorks was gearing up for the Road to El Dorado for, for that. That'd be a great film. I was running into some I don't know resistance. You know, I was I was I had been animating on Prince of Egypt and you know I, I thought I had built a pretty decent reel and they wanted me to go through the review process again, and, which I, I understand. You know, you, you could want to pick their teams and things like that, but suddenly. Because I had a friend, Greg Manwaring, who was working Iron Giant, and he called me up and he said, like, hey man, do you want to come over and interview for this film uh, called The Iron Giant? So I him, he's friends with Brad Bird, so he's like, mm-hmm. friend Brad Bird. And I said, sure, so you know, I went over and interviewed him, and they offered me a job. So I said, okay, I do this, because <laughs> the, they also offered me double the money when I was making DreamWorks. So I, you know, I, I got a chance to become an animator on Iron Giant, uh, increase my income, and I knew a family dog really the pieces that I didn't know who Brad was. He was just he's a dynamo. And that was another you know, chance for me to work under somebody who really pushed me and gave me opportunities that I wouldn't have gotten. I mean, Brad brought in a lot of people who were sort of junior. He gave a lot of us a chance. Mm-hmm. But we even had a different studio. We, we had supervisors, but we worked sort of on a different structure. And we got nice acting scenes that, that could have gotten more to supervisors and more advanced animators. So he took a chance with us, and you know, by doing that, by giving somebody ownership, and this is something that's certain as well, when you give somebody some responsibilities and ownership of the film, they really step up and challenge people with an opportunity to show their strengths and do it. So I was able to get some good scenes uh, to animate there, get to work with Brad for that project, and we can make some great connections and some really great. That's cool. I mean, obviously, you had to work with Brad Bird a bunch of other times after that, too, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. And mainly because of that opportunity mm. to, to work with him once and be on his radar. 
afford to me the chance to work with them again. Um, I was going to say, I had no idea that you worked on Family Guy. Uh, you know, I have to ask, like, what was that whole experience like? It was bizarre. I, I enjoyed it, too, because, like, once again, you know, I worked with a couple of friends. And um, I'm trying to remember when it was after Iron Giant. I ended up out of work for a while, for about six months, uh, looking for work and then maybe not so much looking for work, just taking some downtime. Uh, I got hired on to Family Guy, and this was, I think, the first season as a sheet timer, mm-hmm. uh, just timing out animation. And it was just an interesting, bizarre experience to kind of, for me, guess at the timing of the animation that we get sent out to Korea for them to animate it. I was just thinking, can we just animate this? <laughs> we'll probably do it quicker and easier than you know, guessing at this time. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how long I worked. I don't know stay, how long I stayed there. But, uh, it was fun. You know, it's, a, it's a different TV. Is definitely different. Animal. Yeah, no, I bet. I really bet. And I guess from there, like um, when you going on onto Pixar, I mean, obviously that's a pretty monumental part of um, of any anyone's kind of work history. So what was it like? I mean, when you initially approached them, like how did it all happen? And more importantly, like you know, what was it like when you initially started out there? Because they had just finished doing Toy Story and Monsters, Inc. was their their second project, right? Oh, uh, let's see. They did Toy Story, then a bug. The, 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 yeah, you might have noticed some hesitation in my voice because I was just saying, I'm like, yeah. wait a minute. <laughs> it's a little, little well, early in the morning, but it's, yeah. It's so long ago. I'm trying to place I know. it. <laughs> it's like I'm skipping something yeah, really important here. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I came up and I worked, I think third, the third film was Monsters, Inc. And I, that's the one I came in. Um, and that was also uh, uh, because I worked with Brad and they were, you know, uh, he knew my work, um, but it still wasn't easy to get in. I had applied a few times and received rejections. And I think it was actually the, the third, I had my third rejection letter. And, you know, I'm trying to put the story together and I'm trying to remember it properly. I mean, you know how some people, like, stories change over time, but this is how I remember. Um, I had gotten my third rejection letter from them and I got a call from, again, my friend Greg Manwer, and you know, it, was, it was Brad. He said, hey, I just heard Pixar's hiring. And I got my rejection letter, you know, but, but I just got rejected. So I called them again and said, I, you know, I heard you guys are hiring and I just sent my stuff up there and it's, they said they'd take a look at it. And this, you know, one of the things I've, I've learned sometimes no from a studio or rejection from a studio doesn't mean no, you're not good enough. It just means you know, the door's not open right now. So mm-hmm. don't stop knocking, you know, keep, keep trying. Uh, and that's, you know, so I, I knocked again and this time the door opened. I didn't have much, I didn't really have any CG experience I had. For Prince of Egypt, we had done a little bit from all the background slaves. Uh, I had some experience with CG animation, but they hired me on the strength of my acting and my 2D reel. And with the idea that they would train the work group of us that came up from Iron Giant, that had been Iron Giant. And they decided they would you know, train us on the, the computer system there. Uh, and it was, we were supposed to go through a 10 week training program. And Ended up being a two-week training program. They decided the best way to learn is to just you know, <laughs> throw you in the in the water and yeah. swim. There you go. Yeah. So you know, they threw us in and we started doing bits and pieces on monsters and to speed. Yeah, so it, was, it was a great experience. It was you know, a little nerve-wracking. It took me a long time to feel comfortable uh, doing CG. About three years, I think, before I started to feel like that. Yeah. What was it like for you? I mean, going from <laughs> not having any 3D experience at all and you know, going into like a whole new world. Um, I, I don't know. For me, like, I can't even remember what that's like to learn. Like these days, if you want to learn a new 3D package, you already know yeah. enough of them that they're all the same. And that's one thing that, again, I think so many people don't seem to understand is that if you know one or two, you know all of them. And um, But yeah, but when you're starting out, it's like a whole new concept. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a whole different world. I mean, for you, you already said it, but like, how intimidating was it to kind of go in there and, and be like, okay, put down your pens and pencils because you don't need them anymore. Um. <laughs> it was, it was, it was confidence shaking. I mean, I really thought I was going to be a fire most of the time for quite a while because I also, you know, Pixar has a different mentality up there than, than the LA based studios where at that time at least you, know, you were on for a project that you were going you never, when you were going to get notified, like, okay, we don't need you anymore. That kind of thing. That's how the studios were running back then. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Pixar had a different, attitude where they wanted to bring people, keep them on, keep them between pictures and things like that. But I still had the LA mentality of, you know, I was waiting for the axe to drop all the time. <laughs> you know, it just shakes your confidence where you, you 
think you've developed your skills to a certain level, and all of a sudden you're trying to get this new tool, and you're looking it's like shit, you're just dying. You're like, but I, I know I can do better than this. I just, how do I make it do this? And that, that's how I felt at ILM using that proprietary software. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really frustrating, you know, because you just it makes you think I can't do it. I can't do this. And you have to convince yourself, look, everyone else is struggling. And, Everyone else is learning is, is also going through the same thing, so it's part of the process. Yeah, um, and you're saying it took about three years before you really kind of felt like you you got it. Um, so yeah, yeah. During that time, like you know, how like how I guess for everyone, like you know, was there a lot of friction? Was there a lot of resistance to the tools, or was it kind of like okay, like this is the future, this is what we're doing, and we just got to keep at it and hone our craft? No, I was I was uh, I, I tried to hang on to the old ways. I was like, oh, you know. I remember my pencil never used to you know, <laughs> <laughs> lose my work like this. And yeah, I had many, many days of you know, yeah. frustration. Um, one thing you touched on, you said before about like, because I, I think, again, it's such a critical thing is how you're saying that when if you get those rejection letters, like no doesn't necessarily mean you're not good enough. It means just keep trying. And like, I, I had the same kind of stories about me growing up. Like there's a game studio in my local city when I was like 14 and everyone mm-hmm. I knew would tell me like, you're not old enough to, to go work in the industry. And on top of that, like I would get rejection after rejection from that studio. But for me, you know, I didn't take that as like, okay, you know, the door is closed. It just meant I've, I've got to keep getting better. And I, I always think back to then if like, if I just gave up, like everyone told me to, and if I gave up, like I thought I, you know, at times, you know, felt like I should, um, what the hell I'd be doing for my life now. But, but that's just it. Like, um, even when I had that persistence, there were times where I was going to give up and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to try one more time. And if my reel isn't good enough, then I'm going to quit. And, um, but that's just it. Like, you know, it's, I think it's just that persistence. Like if you, if anything, it's uh, I feel like it's an endurance test for the industry. Cause if you're going to quit, then it says you're not right for this industry because yeah. as you said before, it's, this is a career. It's not a job. There's no such thing in visual effects or 3d. I should say um, that yeah. that is just like a job where you try it out like Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're looking to, to keep building and growing and yeah. You know, and that takes persistence, definitely. Yeah. And whenever you do get those letters, it should just be like, okay, uh, I got to keep at it, not like, you know, let it affect you or, or bring you down. I think that's really critical because mm-hmm. it can get pretty emotional getting those, yeah. um, you know, a letter saying, you know, thanks, you're on file, <laughs> goodbye, and not really giving. Yeah. Well, the first thing that hits you is like, I'm not good enough. Mm. They don't want me. I'm not good enough. You know, it brings up all those doubts you, you get usually, you know, about, you know, the, your capabilities. And sometimes it helps if the studio gives you a little information. Um, I don't know many places that do that. It's usually very generic. Pixar, yeah, Pixar used to try and give a little bit of um, advice about you know, yeah. what the weak point was, or you know, if you can find somebody that you admire or somebody who's, who's willing to give you a good critical you know, review, and you can find out what you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I'll segue for a second. That's a good point. Um, you know, were there any mentors that you had around you? And I feel like, you know, we're all constantly, you know, even people that might have been in the industry as long as us, we, um, you know, the, you can still get so much from those relationships. But for you, were there any mm-hmm. kind of uh, key mentors along the way or people you look for, turn to, I should say, for inspiration? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I owe a lot to Rodolf Gennadin, who's the animator uh, who took me under his wing and basically taught me to animate. Mm-hmm. That's cool. I met him in London and saw my work, my, my drawings, and hired, he brought me onto his team. As, as in between. You know, I've worked with him off and on and known him, you know, for a long time. And if it wasn't for him, I'd probably you know, be doing what I'm doing. Another one was Christoph Sarand, who was also at DreamWorks. I think he still is. He's had animation. Early on, you know, he, he was one of these people who I would, you know, try some things, try some animation, and I would show it to him. It was just, he would honestly, but brutally, you know, dissect my work. Things like I remember bringing him some work one time and he just flipped through it and dumped it in the trash can and just like, <laughs> well, wow. start, start over. And, you know, it was a, it was painful and he wasn't being an asshole or anything. He was just being honest. It's like this, you know, you can do better. And, and so I dug in and tried and I did better. You know, he didn't just, you know, dismiss me completely. He gave me what I needed to do. <laughs> it's shit. So, Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like, try something else. You know, he gave me a point or something that I should look for and I needed to do. So he was one. James Baxter, I had the opportunity to work on James Baxter and I would take my work at Drew Books and from there. Mm-hmm. 
That's cool. And yeah, a lot of those, those people were great. And I, I guess I want to ask you this earlier because you kind of touched on it at the very beginning. And I'm, I'm going to try one more time and say um, you going to Amblin, Amblin, fuck, Amblin, Mation. I know it's it, it's. It's like animation, but anim- it's kind of funny because Christina always butchers. Um, I think it's because she's slightly dyslexic or something, but uh, she always butchers <laughs> the M's and N's. And I've always been able to say yeah. criminal animal, like it's fine, but yeah, amblinmation. There, I got it. Yeah, I can't say I can't say am- anthropomorphize. That's that one. Anthrop- just anthropomorphize. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I think we need some alcohol. <laughs> I think this would. There we go. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but like. Um, one thing you did mention was like uh, working abroad and that's one thing I did want to bring up because I know how well traveled you are and I also feel like so many people that we know are not very well traveled and I think it's just such a, a critical thing. In fact, I had a meeting uh, earlier today with uh, a colleague of mine and we we're talking about hiring, um, uh, kind of hiring tactics and he had mentioned that someone that he worked with had been recommending uh, hiring people from other countries. However, um, one of the key things that he would always ask them was whether they'd worked abroad. And I thought that was kind of interesting because I'd never heard anyone mention that before. But, you know, rather than saying like, oh, well, ha- you know, what can you bring to my company? What can you do? Um, and obviously hiring people from different cultures is always a bit different just because people in, let's say, North America, typically you kind of get the same uh, conversations you're going to have. You kind of get each other, whereas other countries, you have other cultures. Um, so I thought it was such an impactful thing to hear that, that kind of question raised where it's, you know, hiring people from other places that have worked in other cultures, because it does kind of recalibrate you a little bit. You've got to start thinking a little bit more about, um, how people communicate. There's so many things that, uh, you know, underlying mm-hmm. things that lay into that. And for you, like, what's your opinion? Like how do you, how p- impactful do you think it is for, um, artists and everyone to, to travel and to work in other countries and in other countries and, um, cultures? I think it's vital. I, mean, I think it's vital as a human being to travel and learn about other cultures and, stories and because everyone's got a story you know mm-hmm. I, it, I was lucky that when i went to amblimation in london it was multicultural there were like, I can't remember, something like 40 different nationalities working at the studio and i was coming from michigan you know, a small town michigan it was just an eye-opening experience and you learn that how different everybody is but how everybody's also pretty much the same everybody has the same motivations and the same fears and desires and so you get this cross culture of of, you know differences but then you realize how we're all sort of related and how we can all relate to each other and we want to communicate better yeah i think communication is what we do I mean, we're communicating an idea you know on screen somehow um, and that's key so what better way to learn to communicate more clearly if you learn from other people and other cultures and see how to communicate more clearly and how it's all related Actually, yeah, I think you're right. Actually, that's a, a really great example too. Is about communication because again, the the more you travel, uh, and I think working too. I think working is um, a whole new, a whole different ball game. But like working in countries that's, that English, let's say, is in your, their native language, um, you learn so much more about yourself and how you need to communicate. And I think it it ends up echoing through everything that you do in the future because you you don't take it for granted that you both speak the same language. You've got to start really thinking about how you can say something and also how it can be misinterpreted, uh, you know, all these things. Actually, one of my friends, he was a Disney animator. He went to work in Spain and he kept saying, okay, all the time. And they keep repeating like what they just said. And he's like, okay, I get it. Okay. And they'd repeat it again. And he didn't understand it at first, like what he was saying. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it's just these little things I think are so critical to, um, to uh, you know, I guess the underlying theme here is growth um, with everything we're talking about. But yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm for people to kind of go off and go work at Weta or go work in uh, Japan or China, you know, just completely uh, alienate yourself and adapt. And when you come back, you, you kind of grow as a human being more than just growing um, your career. Yeah. You're, you're enriching yourself mm-hmm. you know, with, that's, with these things. That's cool. And I won't take up too much more of your time, but like um, this touching base a little bit more on Pixar for me, you know, we both read creative ink. I thought that was, um, just a really fascinating um, book to read just in general. But uh, Mm -hmm. that did really get me excited and, you know, to understand more about the culture of Pixar just because it, you, as you said, it, it definitely isn't um, let's say digital domain to me is one of those things that 
I remember back in like 96 or whatever, you know, wanting to go work in LA and hearing, you know, about Titanic and stuff like that, where, you know, the day after uh, DD wrapped on that movie, like letting go of a thousand people. And it just kind of, it really re reinforces the, the mentality that it, this is a service based industry, especially, mm -hmm. uh, you know, visual effects or where you're, where you are uh, supplying a service. And I, I remember being at ILM where we'd have meetings where people would ask like, will we ever make our own content? And of course, the answer would be no, because you look at Pixar, one of the most profitable companies on the planet, and um, they're making their own content. But the thing is that Lucas, um, you know, in terms of the, the empire, the umbrella, you know, you had Jack Films, you had Lucasfilm, you had all these other um, uh, sections of the, the bigger um, company doing their own content. So ILM <laughs> was a service providing industry. If you had a TV commercial, yeah. we'll create the sparkly dust. You know, that's what we we would do. But um, with you guys, like having that more family orientated, uh, we will, you know, invest in you and, and you invest in us mm -hmm. kind of mindset, I think is, is, is really great. But it also um, means that a lot of the lessons that you guys learn, you don't lose every time a project ends and a new team gets built. And that's mm -hmm. one thing that I've seen so many times where we'll have a dream team on one project and then we go, you know, everyone gets let go and then the next project comes up a few months later and we're hiring a whole new team of people. And it's just frustrating because you've got to learn the same mistakes over and over and over. Yeah. And you, you know, it's like, like when you work with people for a long time, you know, their strengths, you know, their weaknesses, you know, where they need to grow, that they know where you need to grow or, you know, and it, it, there's just something about it that that's more efficient in a way. And, uh, I think it produces better storytelling, better acting, uh, better entertainment value by having you know keeping people together longer. Um, I, I guess, and again, it's such an open-ended conversation, but like um, a question. But what do you think were some of the the things that you really took from working, you know, a huge chunk of your career um, at the leading? You know, like one of the leading animation studios in the world who's, you know, who in, in, in essence pioneered a lot of um, what we are doing in, in terms of tech and uh, a lot of the movies that they're doing. Like, um, was there a lot of things that kind of carved you out to who you are or what things you hold on to these days that just were, you know, I loved like the, the story of the brain trust, you know, having every, mm -hmm. you know, every project you've got a director who they go and they do the thing, but you've got a support team who isn't going to tread on your toes, but they're there to kind of help uh, your vision mm -hmm. be as strong as it can be. Um, mm -hmm. What's the kind of stuff that for you kind of uh, stuck with you and you've taken and cherished after leaving there? Uh, a lot of memories, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and friendships and things and free like that. Pizza. So, <laughs> <laughs> Staying in touch with a lot of people uh, from up there. Um, one of the things, you know, I think, I think, Troll Hunters right now is getting a lot of notice for its quality, its visual quality, uh, because it's a TV show, and TV shows aren't supposed to look as strong as this one does. And a lot of that comes from Rodrigo taking, I mean, myself taking, but he's, he's the uh, showrunner, sorry. He's showrunner and executive producer, so you know, he's done all the shots. And, but the lessons I also learned was something Lasseter would always say quality is the best business model. Don't don't settle. That comes from Steve Jobs as well. Don't settle. Really, if you know what you want, you know, up on the screen, just push for it. You know, really fight for it. Get the get the quality up there. Um, but don't sell yourself short. In that way. I, I can't stand, and I run into this, and I run, it, I run into it Pixar as well. But this kind of yeah, it's good enough. It's like I can't stand it. <laughs> it's good enough. It's just driving me through the roof. And I know you need to make economic decisions. You don't want to. Kill yourself on a blade of grass that no one's going to see. That's going to be in shadow in a night shot, you know. But um, you know, I, I learned really about getting good people around you, um, working with a good team, and but getting out of the way to allow them to do what they do best, and giving them the support to be able to do what they do best. And you get a lot of friction in jobs where people try to stop you from doing your best or stop you from doing things. That, it's just sometimes the nature of production that it kind of interferes with people trying to get things done a really extra mile. And one of the things with Pixar was about removing those roadblocks so that creative people could uh, open up and do what they were able to do best. Take pride in their work. Take pride in their work and, and you know, go that extra mile, and, um, give them ownership of what they're doing so that they're willing to, to make that effort. You know, because once it up, it's up on screen, it's up on screen forever. So. That's always been my philosophy is that, um, yeah, once it's once it's published, 
you know, like the, once the project's over, you can never go back and change it. And it's been, even for the, the crappiest TV commercials I've worked on, you know, I'll still see stuff and I'm like, oh, you know, they wrong, you know, they use the wrong element in comp or, you know, or <laughs> whatever, you know, they decide to screen that thing or they, they decided that'll do. And, um, and mm-hmm. I've gone through those phases myself for a while where I kind of just got complacent and then, it's only been the last six years, I think, that I kind of got that passion back where, you know, I really want to go the extra mile because, again, like, I, I want to make this the best it can be. And, you know, once it's it's up there, it's it's gone. You can never go back. You can never change it. It's part of history. Yeah. And especially yeah. the projects that you, you're doing where, you know, it's it's something that does affect people. You know, like, you're going to uh, – family is going to go watch that. They're always going to look at it and – you know, it's in a way it has so much more meaning than some bullshit vampire movie or sci-fi thing mm-hmm. or whatever that at the end of the day, you know, I still want to do the best work I can. But um, when I get to work on things like Flight or or things that are actually good movies opposed to, you know, mm-hmm. go watch it on a date and hope you, uh, you know, get laid <laughs> at the end of it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it. Just, you know, something that just, you know, you're, you're buying, you're passing time. It's not relevant, yeah. you know. Or is that something that like the, the, the type of stuff that you've worked on in the past, the things that are going to stick with someone for the rest of their lives, they might like, you know, cherish that moment mm-hmm. going to, yeah. you know, see the movie with their, their parents or whatever, you yeah. know, and it's yeah. critical. And it's because, it's because people care about the projects that they're working on. It's, and when they care, they, they put extra care into it. And so sometimes it's, you know, when you are a project that isn't great, it's, you know, trying to help get people to care about it, how to get yourself to care about it. It's fine, you know, something that makes you really find a reason why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, and like with Troll Hunters, I mean, you know, you've been tied to that project for a while. And I, I, I like how, you know, I, I like the fact that like, whenever we've hung out, it's kind of always been, I feel like things have changed so drastically for you each time from, uh, would it have been like three and a bit years ago? Well, I guess it would be yeah, three years ago this month. <laughs> Happy anniversary. Um, you know, since we first ever hung out and, <laughs> Um, you know, at the time you were at Pixar, I think you might have mentioned that you kind of, I, I, for some reason, I feel like you, you might have mentioned that you had had kind of thoughts about doing something different or you weren't, yeah, you, you did kind of mention you were thinking about other options um, back then. So, it's a bit of a struggle. Yeah. But the next time was that, you know, uh, you were now working on, um, you know, uh, at DreamWorks and you couldn't say, I think at the time what it was, or I think then you finally mm-hmm. did, but anytime we caught up, it was just like, yeah, I can't say anything yet. But, uh, yeah, I mean, every time like you've gone and gone through that growth and for you now, like having spent, I'm guessing two years on the project, I'm just th- guessing or how long has it been? Yeah. Roughly two years, just, just under two years. Yeah. Like, how do you feel now? Like, you know, what are some of the challenges you're going through? Uh, I mean, you know, like I said, uh, unfortunately, I haven't actually had a chance to look at it yet, and I've, I've actually mm-hmm. been really curious about it. So I thought this is great because I get to find out a bit and get a bit of a backstory on everything before I <laughs> start getting engrossed into it. But how's the yeah. journey been so far? It's been great. I mean, I, I have learned so much, and it is a yeah a constant learning process. And um, you know, I, I I find I'm I'm challenged. I get to use a lot of the skills that I have developed. Uh, in writing and acting and animation and uh, storytelling. Um, yes, I'm, I've never been admittedly a great decision maker, believe it or not. And uh, directing, you have no choice. You know, it's got, you gotta make, you gotta make a call. It's like, and there's, you know, hundreds of them nonstop. And you have to get rid of the fear that you're making the wrong choice because you probably, you know, you will. Chances are, mathematically, it's impossible to make all these different choices. You're going to make a boneheaded choice sooner or later, and then you have to learn to live with it, or deal with it, or correct it, and just keep going. So that's been a great learning process for me as well. And then, um, you know, as I said, I don't work directly with Guillermo. He comes through, he reviews the, the material occasionally, and I you know, get some notes. So I, I get to learn from some things from him, and I get to work with my friend Rodrigo, who gives great notes. You know, so I'm learning about it camera you know and staging and composition it's just you know it's like i viewed it as a chance to leave I left pixar it was a chance for me to go down and go to directing school mm-hmm. for a period of time and that's exactly what i'm getting and, so, and i guess there's another pixar lesson there about you know why go to directing school when you can just figure it out on the job right <laughs> yeah yeah that's true <laughs> that's great i mean again like having such a, a huge vast knowledge of experience it's it's a natural progression and um 
you know, doing something on that scale. I mean, that's, that's really cool. Um, with your team, I mean, obviously, again, uh, probably a lot of people you've worked with before, but at the same time, like, um, what's it like having such a, you know, a fresh new team of people that you get to um, work on something as ambitious as this? And, you know, and again, it's Netflix, which is a new territory in a lot of ways, too. It's been a great experience. I, mean, I don't know how much I'm allowed to reveal or talk about the, the actual process of what we do. Um, but it's, again, it's like I was saying, you know, it's, it's getting, there's a certain excitement about the project. So people are bringing uh, an extra level to it and always, you know, pushing it and coming up with different ideas. And you know, how about we try this instead? Or, you know, this, this isn't quite working. What do you think if we try that instead? And you need to, you know, keep that open to, I like to keep those, that, those channels open. Like I work with my, my editor, Graham Fisher, very closely. And, uh, you know, from the beginning, I, I didn't know what his process was like, but I remember directing commercials at Pixar. Tim Fox, the editor I worked with there, we just had a very open relationship. And he would tell me, make suggestions about a story or, you know, this shot isn't working. We just had a very open board. And so I established that with Graham right away. And as well as my coordinator, Greta Moser, you know, they're, they're welcome to pitch in ideas at any time. And, say if things aren't working for them or if they some you know this doesn't i can't understand this you know, i don't you know, I don't know why dictatorship I, I think it's a team effort mm -hmm. very much so and I, and I learn a lot from them as well that's cool and i think it just makes the project better and more fun when everybody's in on it and having a good time and, you know trying to solve problems so i, I love I, it's a small team really it's just you know there's there's uh, lane bogan rodrigo who's the showrunner rodrigo gloss uh, Joanne, Matt, and myself are the four you know, main directors, as well as Guillermo. And uh, so we have a sm small director team, and then we each work with our editors and our coordinators, as well as, you know, there's a, a pretty healthy support team of you know, people, assets, and things like that. So, That's great. But it's not a huge uh, crew. It's a very nice, tight crew. So it keeps things, you know, everybody's kind of involved in everything. In yeah. You're like a rock star team. It's just... And uh, I like when you do it with the smaller teams just because then, um, yeah, I mean, nothing really gets lost in conversation. You've got, you know, people that yeah. you're, you're all in constant communication with and be able to play off each other's strengths. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you, you know, you can just like, um, chat somebody quickly. Hey, you know, what's up with this, this mom? Why is it him with that? And just they reply right away and you're using it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. What are some of the big challenges though, like on, um, you know, a project like this, especially for you directing it, um, that you guys run into or experience? Well, for me, it was switching over from feature, which, you know, you know large budgets and a lot of time to television, much smaller budgets and much more demanding schedule. And not just for one episode, once you finish one episode, there's another one behind that, and another one behind that, and behind that. And so you can't get bogged down. It throws the whole thing off. So the pressure was pretty intense at times. And you know, juggling, there were times where I was juggling six or seven shows through the pipeline at the same time, whether it was, you know, um, doing some script work or not writing, but script analysis, reading, mm -hmm. you know, getting ready to launch an episode, uh, to actually launch it with the board artists, um, going through a revision process on another one while launching layout and another one while reviewing animation and two others. And, you know, you're just, you're booked, jam-packed back to back and looking at lots of shots and different episodes and like, okay, wait, what, this is the episode that, that's right. Okay. So this is the one that blah, blah, blah. And, you know, trying to jog your memory. And that's cool. That's really cool. Trying to make, yeah, trying to make decisions that are smart and uh, push the story forward and but are also economical because you don't have a huge budget. I, I just had a quick look on um, IMDb at Troll Hunters and, you know, Ron Perlman is doing a voice for one of the characters. That, that doesn't surprise <laughs> me in the slightest. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I think it's cool. I mean, getting to... Sorry, I'm loading up too many pages. Um, getting to work with Gelmo, I mean, as you mentioned, you don't get the... Like, I guess with anyone who has his hands in like a thousand things, it's it's always going to be um, mm -hmm. tricky. But um, yeah, I mean, just in general, how how well has it been received so far? I mean, the first season's been out for a while, right? Yeah, it's been very well received. You know, Netflix doesn't give numbers. They just they just kind of give a general idea that it's going well, that you know, Twitter's exploded, uh, positive material, and the IMDb reviews have been great, as well as the Netflix reviews. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Um, who, yeah, are, who are all the directors? Cool. You mentioned them before, but yourself, obviously. And uh, Elaine Bogan, Joanne Matt, 
um, Rodrigo Blas, who's also the show That's great. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, in general, like what what's coming up for you? I mean, obviously, you're going to be speaking in Paris pretty soon. Um, yeah. What other stuff do you have coming up besides um, getting in the street fights and starting your own fight club? <laughs> yeah, don't talk about fights. That's rule number one. That's right. <laughs> um, we are buried in season two on Troll Hunters and working away on that. And then beyond that, uh, I have a few other things lined up. But uh, I'm definitely looking forward to Paris. Yeah. What's your talk going to be on? Because I'm just going to give a bit of backstory. Like, I've loved all of your talks. Uh, I actually hated. <laughs> I'm going to pause here and make you, uh, you know, be like, what the hell is he about to say? No, I hated. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to give a talk last year and I wanted mine to be a bit different to everyone else's, but still be mm-hmm. a little bit related to career and everything else. So I went. Yeah. And yeah. shot a bunch of video and I did everything on the iPhone, the entire thing. It was really fun. But a lot of um, what I, a lot of key underlying things I wanted to talk about, it was just funny watching everyone else's talks because I, I got to my talk at the mm-hmm. very end. It was the second last talk of the uh, the session. And I was just like, everyone has fucking said what I, what I was going to say already. So I feel like I shouldn't repeat myself. <laughs> but um, your first talk at the first It's Art Masterclass uh, was, I guess, deconstructing a lot of the um a lot of really great performances and and talking a lot about your experiences as well and i found that to be really original and also really motivating and the the last talk you gave as well is just is very relaxed but i love the fact that you could talk about your experiences with bricklaying then going to pixar animation and then putting some bruce lee (laughs) in there as well um you know but again it was just it was one of those things that i felt like everything um you you had to say it was so relevant and hopefully everyone was really paying attention and getting a lot from it because there was so much great advice in there like what's your talk this you never know what's this this year is um experience as a first-time director basically mm-hmm. i'm just going to talk about um, you know things i've learned a lot of a little bit of what we've talked about here and um just that transition from from my being in a comfort zone to being in, you know very uncomfortable zone. <laughs> learning lessons sometimes the hard way so that's basically what's going to be about so stuff like uh first day of directing make sure you fire someone to set an example and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly Screen. yeah um that's awesome man i'm really looking forward to uh, catching up and um yeah i you know i think your talk's going to be amazing so i'm looking forward to getting to sit and what's your what, what day is yours on this, this? uh I always get put on like day three, I think. I, to be honest, like I, I heard, uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day, completely different um, thing as a entrepreneurial podcast, but one of the guys, he's holding an event uh, this month actually. And I guess a lot of people are getting upset because he hasn't done his talk yet. And I'm, I want to steal his speech of saying like um, the reason he hasn't done his talk yet because he wants to leave it to the last minute. So that way it's the most relevant. So, uh, cause I, I, I haven't actually figured out entirely. There's a bunch of different subjects that I want to cover and I'm trying to figure out whether to, you know, what I want to talk about. Part of me wants to talk about um, more, you know, uh, how to run a business and, you know, mm-hmm. launching your own studio because it's something I've done a lot as well as help uh, launch a few other um, companies. But part of me also yeah. wants to do more technical director stuff. So like how to automate everything that you do so that way you're able to, um, you know, the bits that you do are actually relevant rather than, you know, the, the cog mm-hmm. bits that can be automated. Um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's going to be the last day, which um, I, I vowed this time to make sure my talk's done before I leave. Because the last time I ended up just alternating between the bar, the stage, and and uh, <laughs> yeah, writing my talk. Yeah, I hope I can see it. I, I, we have to leave Sunday again. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, this is the, the other problem with working on television is getting time off. It's just... Yeah. <laughs> but either way, uh, I think it's going to be great. I'm, I'm excited just because... Um, there's so many awesome people coming this year that it's just going to be really fun. Like, you know, Neil Blevins, obviously, and uh, he's going to bring Kat. Oh, uh, he's going to make yeah. it. Oh, so good. Neil's going to be there. He's bringing Kat. Who, I love Kat. She's such a, uh, sorry, a, a ball buster um, that I've actually wanted to bring her on the podcast and, and she she's agreed to do it uh, just because, again, like she's a female in a very male uh, dominated industry but at the same time she doesn't take crap she's been around for so long at many of the leading studios like Tippett and ilm uh so, mm-hmm. and she she's very opinionated in a good way um so mm-hmm. i just think that she would have so much to say um that yeah i think it'd be really cool just to kind of talk about her perspective yeah. and things um but yeah there's um like ryan church dan rarity uh obviously like nathan fowler mike blum um mm-hmm. ash thorpe's a really amazing motion graphics designer um I don't know. Nicholas, Nicholas, um, 
forgotten his last name. Escapes me. Starts with a P. Um, Disney guy. Disney yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy. Um, shit. I, I've yeah. I I know who you're talking about. I'm I'm completely drawing a blank too. <laughs> and um, but yeah, just in general, like I I think this time is going to be great. Um, I'm hoping yeah. that yeah. you know everyone's going to get a lot of fun and get to interact with everyone a lot. And yeah, I just hope the weather's going to be good because <laughs> that's the only downside of March. <laughs> But uh, cr- yeah, I just bought some new shoes meant just for the you know wet kind of cold weather. So. Nice. I just bought some slippers on Amazon so that way I can keep my feet warm in Portland. So <laughs> it's kind of similar, right? Um, but yeah, Christina's going to be coming as well, uh, which will be fun because Great. the first time we went, as you know, we had a connecting flight through uh, Mexico City. I and remember. <laughs> she oh, drank the water, and uh, so therefore she didn't yeah. get to leave the hotel. I felt so- so bad for her. That was terrible. <laughs> I told her not to drink any of the water too. And it was until the very last meal we had before we hopped on the flight. She ordered like Coca Cola with ice. And, and the yeah, ice. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. whenever you go to China, um, it's, you know, whenever you're at like a nightclub or something, you always get Coke and no ice. And if they give you ice, it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, send it back. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm psyched. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, it's going to be really cool yeah. to catch up. And um, I'm hoping to still be in LA at least once a month, is my goal. Um, so. Yeah, I, I mean to drop down to DreamWorks and say hi to everyone. Uh, so when I do, I'll, I'll definitely let you know I'm in the building. Great. Yeah, I'd love to see cool, you. Cool, man. All right. Well, I will see you in a few weeks. Okay. All right, man. This has been fun. Thanks no so worries. much. And uh, just a heads up, like we'll, we'll wrap things there. But um, yeah, this is really cool, man. Like I had a blast doing this. Um, yeah, the, I'll just give you a heads up. The audio has been a bit iffy, but I'm going to see what I can do about mm-hmm. making it sound amazing. So we'll, we'll work something okay. out. Um, and... I'm going to start publishing these pretty soon. I'll give you a heads up because I want to try and get as many out before the event. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know and I'll send links to everything. And also if there, like I'll, I'll get my assistant to going to go through all the, um, the whole episode and kind of mine it for links, references and everything that we can post in the show notes. But if there are other, Mm -hmm. um, links that you want me to provide, uh, I'm more than happy to add those in. Sweet. Cool. So yeah, just let me know if there's anything. Um, do you have a personal website, by the way? I usually ask that, and I, I totally not. forgot to, but I had a feeling you don't. So I do not. Yeah. So that's another one. I, I need to get some of my stuff up online and get a little self promotion going. So I'm just cu- sorry that- to cut you off. Like I was just going to say, I'm I'm curious about that. So like, is that one thing that you want to make a bit of a goal this year is to start um, building kind of your presence? Um, as a director and and more establish yourself um, now? Because uh, you are mentioning at the very beginning that obviously DreamWorks, and again, I'm not recording any of this, but um, you mentioned that DreamWorks wasn't really publicly promoting you guys. But on top of that, is it something you personally would like to do a bit more of this year is get your name out there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I just think it's, you know, this is, you know, all of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a critical some, part. You know, it's... Yeah, you got to do some groundwork. Yeah, so. that's cool. Well... You know, uh, we can talk about that stuff, but I'd be happy to help out any way I can. Um, are you are you represented yet? Like, um, I'm assuming you are. Uh, I just let my manager go. Okay. Um, because uh, I I don't like the deal. He didn't get me much on this. You know, signing on to DreamWorks for the next show. And, you know, he wanted a percentage, and it was like he, he kind of balls things up. I'm not yeah. going to give you a percentage for a job that I got me, and then I had to go in and renegotiate my salary. No, you're not getting anything. Yeah. So, we parted ways. So, um, besides your manager, though, because it's the one thing I've kind of learned a lot about recently is, you know, how, how much of a difference there is between an agent and a, a manager in that regard. But, like, um, do, you, do you currently have, like, an agent that you're working with? No, I don't. I'm unrepresented okay. right now. Um, I think this is part of the decision why I, I didn't stick with my manager. Because, I, you know, he was good. He's great. He's meant to have your back. That's the number one uh, difference, I guess. Is, yeah. Yeah. It's just that um, I'm going to be at DreamWorks doing this. I'm look, working under an A-list director right now, uh, doing a show that's getting a lot of notice. And there's going to be probably shows attached to this. So this is going to last for a while. So I, I didn't see the need to... Have someone mooch 10%. <laughs> yeah, and setting up meetings for me at studios where I'm probably going to jump into jobs right now because it's not... You know, as any as well as anybody in this business, it's hard to get things made. Yep. that's the hardest thing. And I'm getting things made right now under Guillermo del Toro. So yeah, I can't ask for a better situation than that. I can suffer through the money for a while, but I don't want to go to Fox and develop a film that's never going to get made. Yep. I'd keep I'd get more shows under my belt. And, 
you know, actually have something to show. And that's one thing, again, like it's something I can't speak of directly, but I've got a few friends that have worked with Guillermo and that's one thing that he's always been good about is that I, I guess if you get to get more personal time with him, uh, he's definitely someone who... <laughs> Uh, keeps people around like I've got one of my friends I cannot remember his last name it's been it's actually been exactly 10 years I think but he um, he uh, worked with Guillermo and something and ended up being his art director ever since uh, after like one you know couple of meetings of working together but there's a few people that he's gonna be like okay I, I like working with you and therefore that's you know everything I do is, yeah. is going to have you tied to it in one way or another, which is always great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Rodrigo and my friend has that relationship with them, you know, so far he likes what we're doing. So, great, man. <laughs> All right, so that is it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Again, apologies for the audio quality, but I hope you still managed to pull a lot of diamonds in the rough, I'll say, from this episode. Uh, I want to thank Andrew again. It was so awesome getting to chat about everything. Um, I definitely feel like this episode for me is really inspiring, and I got a lot from it. Like I said, if you want to find out more about Andrew or you want links to the talk that he gave this year at the Paris It's Art Masterclass, uh, I'll leave links to all that in the show notes. So just check out www.alanmckay.com slash 76. So 76. All right, so that is it for now. I have another episode coming up next week. I'll leave it to be a surprise, but I've got a lot of really cool ones actually coming up. Um, I'm really excited about all of this. Also, in case you're not aware, uh, I'm going to leave a link in the show notes to this as well. But I've started doing a lot of live Facebook streams, which has been a lot of fun. Um, basically, just getting to interact with everyone and doing it more on a whim. So I do a lot of career intensives and real or portfolio reviews, things like that online. But this is a little bit different where it's just off the cuff. I get to jump on and do Q&A or I get to do like a live class and teach something. Um, there's a lot of different stuff. So it's, you know, technical things as well as uh, career related and everything else in between. So to be a part of that, you just need to be following my public Facebook page. And that way, whenever I go live, you'll get an alert about that. I've thought about doing a few live podcast episodes as well. So that's an option too. So um I'll leave a link to that in the show notes too. So just look for the Facebook live link. Okay, well, Facebook link. All right, so I'll leave it there. That's it for this episode. I'll be back with a new episode next week. Until then, rock on.